Trent Horn, a member of the Vatican II sect, recently put out a video in which he tries to respond to some of the points I made in my recent debate on sedevacantism. A number of people have done similar things. Their long videos in this regard are really attempts at damage control because their position was shown to be false by the facts and points covered in the debate. Frankly, their videos are really their attempt to have the debate without me actually being there to respond, to correct them, refute them, etc., which is what would happen, by the grace of God, in a debate. Suffice it to say there's no merit to their responses. We plan to have more comments on this, but in this particular video I want to highlight a heresy in one of the many significant errors that Trent Horn promoted in his attempted response to my debate. That is, his attempt to debate me without me actually being there to respond, refute, and correct him. In the debate I pointed out that Vatican II teaches the heresy that Protestants and schismatics who reject the papacy and other dogmas are inside the body of Christ. That teaching of Vatican II is indeed contrary to Catholic dogma. That heresy is taught in number three of Vatican II's decree on ecumenism and in Lumen Gentium, and it's repeated by many statements of the antipopes. Now Trent Horn, who thinks that he can explain away almost every heresy or false doctrine promoted by the Vatican II counterchurch, even though he can't, he fails completely, he just denies reality, not surprisingly tries to defend this heresy of Vatican II as well. But in the process he makes major mistakes and reveals that he's ignorant of basic Catholic dogmatic teaching on ecclesiology, and also that he's unaware of important and relevant aspects of Catholic sacramental theology. Here's what he says in an attempted response to my point. That Protestants and schismatics who reject the papacy and other dogmas are in the body of Christ. Lumen Gentium 15 says the following. The church recognizes that in many ways she is linked with those who, being baptized, are honored with the name of Christian, though they do not profess the faith in its entirety or do not preserve unity of communion with the successor of Peter. For there are many who honor sacred scripture, taking it as a norm of belief and a pattern of life, and who show a sincere zeal. They lovingly believe in God the Father Almighty and in Christ the Son of God and Savior. They are consecrated by baptism, in which they are united with Christ. End quote. So, non-Catholic Christians are a part of the body of Christ in virtue of their valid baptism, but they have an imperfect communion with Christ's church. This, import, this is important to underscore. If non-Catholic Christians are validly baptized, then they are united to Christ. Paul says as much in Romans 6 of anyone who is validly baptized. And the early church recognized the validity of baptisms performed by some heretical groups. So you can't say Protestant baptism is invalid just because it's not Catholic. That means if non-Catholic Christians are united to Christ, then they must be united to the body of Christ, even if they have an imperfect communion with Christ's church. That's completely wrong and actually heretical. His fallacious attempt to defend this clear heresy in Vatican II is connected to his error in sacramental theology, as we will see. According to Trent Horn in Vatican II, people who do not profess the Catholic faith in its entirety or preserve communion under the successor of St. Peter are part of the body of Christ. That's the opposite of Catholic teaching. It's a dogma that people who reject the papacy or any dogma of the church are outside and alien to the body or church of Christ, not part of it. Here's the proof. And in all of these magisterial statements, notice the term body or church of Christ. That's what we're focusing on here. Pope Pius XI, Mortalium Animus, 1928. Furthermore, in this one church of Christ, no man can be or remain who does not accept, recognize, and obey the authority and supremacy of Peter and his legitimate successors. As we can see, people who do not accept the papacy are not part of the body of Christ. That's the Catholic Church's teaching. But it's not the teaching of Vatican II or Trent Horn because they aren't Catholic. So, non-Catholic Christians are a part of the body of Christ in virtue of their valid baptism. Pope Pius VI, Caritas, 1791. For no one can be in the Church of Christ without being in unity with its visible head and founded on the See of Peter. Pope Pius IX, Amantissimus, 1862. There are other almost countless proofs drawn from the most trustworthy witnesses which clearly and openly testify with great faith, exactitude, respect, and obedience that all who want to belong to the true and only Church of Christ must honor and obey this apostolic see and the Roman pontiff. End quote. Those suffice to prove the point and refute Trent Horn in Vatican II, but there's more. 
Pope Eugene IV of the Council of Florence in the Bull Cantate Domino solemnly declared, quote, It, the Holy Roman Church, condemns, rejects, and anathematizes all who think opposed and contrary things, and declares them to be aliens from the body of Christ, which is the Church, end quote. So there you have it. Now this principle, solemnly declared by Florence, applies to people who reject any dogma of the Catholic Church, but just in case someone like Trent Horn tries to diminish the force of Florence's solemn statement here by claiming that it comes after dogmatic statements about the Trinity, some of which Protestants and the Eastern Code Orthodox would accept, note that it comes after a dogmatic statement about the Filioque. The Eastern Code Orthodox don't accept the Filioque. Hence, this solemn pronouncement of Florence proves that the Eastern Code Orthodox who reject the Filioque are aliens from the body of Christ. But that is not the position of Vatican II and Trent Horn. They, on the contrary, heretically teach that the Eastern Quote Orthodox are part of the body of Christ. The falsity of Horn's position should also be apparent to anyone who knows the Catholic Church is teaching that all in the body of Christ have the same faith. That was taught in the Bull Unum Sanctum of Pope Boniface VIII and in many other pronouncements. As Pope Pius XII taught in Mystici Corporis, it follows that those who are divided in faith or government cannot be living in the unity of such a body. Thus, people who do not preserve the faith, such as Protestants or the Eastern Quote Orthodox, are not part of the body of Christ. Pius XII also taught, For not every offense, although it may be a grave evil, is such as by its very own nature to sever a man from the body of the church, as does schism or heresy or apostasy. End quote. Schism, heresy, and apostasy sever a man from the body of the church of Christ. Non-Catholics who reject the papacy or another dogma commit the offense of heresy and are severed from the church of Christ. But someone like Trent Horn might even deny that Protestants commit heresy when they deny the papacy or another dogma. After all, Antipope Benedict XVI said that Protestantism isn't even heresy. Pope Leo XIII teaches the same truth about the Church in his encyclical Satis Cognitum. Quote, the practice of the Church has always been the same, and that with the consenting judgment of the Holy Fathers, who certainly were accustomed to hold as having no part of Catholic communion and as banished from the Church, whoever had departed in even the least way from the doctrine proposed by the authentic magisterium, end quote. Notice, the Catholic Church teaches that those who depart in even the least way from the Church's teaching are considered as having no part of Catholic communion and as banished from the Church. That Church is the body of Christ. What's very interesting about this text is that in the Latin, Leo XIII uses the word expertum, an accusative form of the adjective expers, which literally means having no part. It was providential that Leo XIII used that word. It directly contradicts in advance the heretical teaching of Vatican II and people like Trent Horn, that those who depart from Catholic teaching retain partial communion with the Catholic Church if they are baptized. No, they have no communion with the Church. They are aliens to the Church of Christ. Leo XIII also used the word ex torem, which means ex terra, or having been exiled from a country or a land. One is not exiled from a country or a land if one has partial movement within it. The prefix ex, which Leo XIII uses in these words, means out of, not partly inside. There's more we could quote on this point, but these facts suffice to refute Trenthorn's heresy and false argument on this matter. Now, Trenthorn's heresy and false understanding of this issue are, as I mentioned, connected to his false view on what happens when someone is baptized as a heretic. Horn mentions that members of heretical groups can perform or receive a valid baptism, which is true. From that premise, he proceeds to conclude falsely that non-Catholics who are validly baptized are necessarily united to Christ and to the body of Christ by that valid baptism. He argues thus. This, import, this is important to underscore. If non-Catholic Christians are validly baptized, then they are united to Christ. Paul says as much in Romans 6 of anyone who is validly baptized. And the early church recognized the validity of baptisms performed by some heretical groups. So you can't say Protestant baptism is invalid just because it's not Catholic. That means if non-Catholic Christians are united to Christ, then they must be united to the body of Christ, even if they have an imperfect communion with Christ's church. But he's wrong. He's ignorant of true Catholic teaching on this matter. Someone who is baptized as a heretic, for example, a 30-year-old Protestant who rejects the papacy, can indeed be validly baptized if proper matter, form, etc. are used, and thus he would receive the baptismal character in that valid baptism, but he would not receive any grace or union with the Christ. He would not become a part of the Church of Christ by that baptism. His heresy is an impediment to the bestowal of the sacramental grace and union with Christ. Trenhorn clearly doesn't realize this. 
but it's the teaching of the church, and you can see this, for example, in Pope St. Gregory I's letter to the bishops of Spain dated June 22, 601. Speaking of those validly baptized as heretics, Pope Gregory teaches, quote, The holy baptism which they received among the heretics at that time restores the power of cleansing in them when they have been united to the holy faith and the heart of the universal church, end quote. As we see, people can be validly baptized as heretics, but they are not cleansed by that baptism or united with Christ until they put away their heresy and embrace the faith of the church. When the person puts away his heresy and joins the church, then the effect of the valid baptism which he received as a heretic kicks in. The same is taught by St. Augustine, St. Thomas, and others. St. Augustine, quote, Assuredly, those who are baptized outside the rock on which the church is built are not washed, but defiled. St. Augustine also says, quote, And just as baptism is of no profit to the man who renounces the world in words and not in deeds, so it is of no profit to him who is baptized in heresy or schism, but each of them, when he amends his ways, begins to receive profit from that which before was not profitable, but was yet already in him, end quote. St. Thomas taught the same, quote, But this effect of baptism is sometimes hindered by insincerity. Wherefore, when this obstacle is removed by penance, baptism forthwith produces its effect, end quote. In the previous article, he mentioned disbelief as an example of insincerity that prevents the effect of baptism. The same truth is seen in the Council of Florence, which declares that the reception of sacraments only benefits those inside the church. Hence, a heretic who is validly baptized is not united to Christ when he is baptized. We see the same principle in the Council of Trent, which teaches that the sacraments confer grace upon those who don't place an obstacle or impediment in the way. Heresy is an obstacle or impediment to the grace of the sacrament. The same principle is acknowledged by many theologians. For instance, Father Joseph Pohl, writing with an imprimatur in 1916, quote, Theologians are agreed that if baptism be received by an adult in the state of mortal sin, he can obtain the graces of the sacrament later when the obstacle has been removed by contrition or by the worthy reception of penance, end quote. That principle, of course, applies to heretics. Since Trenhorn simply doesn't understand Catholic teaching on this matter, which is not surprising because he's not in the Catholic Church, but rather in the Vatican II sect, he attempts to defend Vatican II's blatant heresy that Protestants and others who deny Catholic teaching are part of the body of Christ with a completely fallacious argument. He realizes that heretics can receive a valid baptism, which is true. But since he doesn't understand that heretics don't receive grace or union with Christ by that baptism until they remove the obstacle of heresy, he wrongly concludes that they become part of the Church of Christ and that Vatican II's false teaching is correct when it's not. This, import, this is important to underscore. If non-Catholic Christians are validly baptized, then they are united to Christ. So he just misleads people and defends heresy against Catholic teaching with his ignorance. The heresy promoted by Trent Horn, that heretics who reject the papacy are in the body of Christ, which is the opposite of Catholic teaching, as we've seen, has also been promoted by Tim Staples and, quote, Catholic Answers on a number of occasions. Uh, Ruth, if your non-Catholic friend is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in water, then he is part of the body of Christ. That's heresy. So this is just one example from Trent Horn's attempted rebuttal that we've examined here in detail. And we've shown that he's completely wrong, that he defends heresy, and that he's ignorant of relevant facts. We could go through his whole video. Vatican II's heretical teaching that people who reject the papacy or another dogma are part of the body of Christ, which Trenhorn unsuccessfully tried to defend, by itself proves that the Vatican II antipopes are not true popes. And there are, of course, many other heresies on the Jews, the Muslims, etc. Also, in his video, Trenhorn basically complained that in the debate I mentioned so many different things. He implied that when you examine them individually, they don't prove the point. His claim is false, as we've proven here. We have the facts and the details, and when we examine these matters in detail, we just further prove our point, as we've shown. Moreover, even though he acts as if he's very familiar with the quotes that I covered in the debate, I highly doubt that he was even aware of many of them before the debate occurred. There was also much more the time did not permit me to cover in the debate. There were questions on the heresies of Benedict XVI, John Paul II, and Paul VI, and other things that I didn't have time to get into. Yet, since there's an overwhelming amount of heresy coming from the Vatican II antipopes and the counterchurch, it's important to cover a significant portion of it in a debate like that to paint an accurate picture of the situation. But when you're dealing with someone like Trent Horn, you are dealing with a completely faithless individual who is not of the truth. There's no other way to put it. He doesn't believe in Catholic teaching, and a person like that cannot see things as they are. He's blind. He also dishonestly attempts to explain away the most obvious heresies and facts, and he fails in the process. 
If Trenhorn wants to have a debate on one of these related issues, or perhaps the salvation issue, since he claims we are in heresy on that matter, when in fact he is the heretic who does not remotely believe in the Catholic Church's teaching that there's no salvation outside the Church, I'm willing to do that. But the facts in this video prove that he's wrong and that he doesn't understand or adhere to true Catholic teaching. There's a lot more we could say, but that's all for this video. Thank you.